Hello everyone, last time we left off with uh, Paris choosing uh, Aphrodite as the fairest and thus giving her the golden apple as her prize. Um, afterwards there had to be kind of a tense uh, situation I would imagine. I mean you got Hera and Athena both pissed off at uh, Paris for not picking uh, either one of them. And I guess you would probably have a gloating uh, Aphrodite with her golden apple. And uh, I'm sure Paris realized the uh, predicament he was in now. He's got two of the most powerful goddesses in the world pissed off at him. And, uh, does he? And, uh, but he does have Aphrodite's affection now. So he probably thinks uh, some good stuff's coming his way. And uh, before the goddesses leave with uh, Hermes, back to, I uh, guess, either the wedding of uh, Peleus and uh, Thetis or going back to Mount Olympus, I'm sure Aphrodite uh, reassures Paris that he will get the most beautiful woman in the world one day. So they end up leaving, and uh, Paris is probably just left there standing, uh, wondering what the hell just happened. But, uh, yeah, a couple of months go by... And, uh, still, nothing out of the ordinary has happened since the judgment. So, uh, Paris is, uh, probably starting to wonder what the hell. Did I just get bullshitted here? But then one day, word comes, uh, from, uh, Troy that the, uh, King, uh, Priam is having a big festival and tournament and stuff. Now, there are a couple of different versions of what happened, um... It kind of seems like Agalaus, uh, Paris's, uh, well, I guess you could say adoptive father, uh, tells Paris not to go to Troy, and Paris doesn't listen to him, yada, yada, yada. But basically, Paris ends up going to Troy for the festival and tournament. Uh, again, there are a couple of different versions of what happened when he's there. Some say he enters a foot race and wins, thus being the fastest man in Troy. Others say he wins a duel, fighting with like wooden swords against other princes and heroes and stuff. But whatever, basically, they all say he comes to Troy, he wins a tournament, and draws attention to himself. Probably the best uh, version of it I like is actually from the video game uh, Warriors Legends of Troy. And that they basically have um, King Priam giving uh, some gold coins to some of his uh, servants saying, go forth and find us a great bull to sacrifice for the festival and the tournament and stuff. So they go off and uh, they come across Agalaus in Paris, who remember his uh, adoptive parents named him Alexander. So they basically stumble upon them and uh, they offer to buy their finest bull. And, uh, Agalaus and Paris are like, okay. But at nighttime, those servants decide to keep the gold for themselves, and they actually steal the bull. So the next morning, uh, that's why Paris goes to Troy to try and get the bull back. So he actually enters the tournament and, uh, wins a couple of duels, you know, with wooden swords so nobody gets hurt and stuff. But, uh, when it comes time to, uh, fight De Phobos, and after that, I guess he would fight Hector, he's like, screw that shit, I ain't fucking with those guys, so he actually tries to steal the bull back, and uh, De Phobos gets so angry at this outrage, they actually pulls out his real sword and chases Paris uh, through the streets of Troy, and uh, seeking refuge, uh, Paris actually runs to the Temple of Zeus, and, you know, tries to hide there, but De Phobos Catches up with him, and right before De Phobos kills Paris, uh, Cassandra shows up. Now, basically, I think it was in the Iliad or some other story, they actually had Paris actually beating Hector and uh, De Phobos and all the other sons of Priam, which I always thought was kind of bullshit. I'm like, what? I mean, Paris isn't a total puss, but I mean, he's not Hector. I mean, Hector is like the biggest, baddest dude in all of Troy. But I guess you could say, well, maybe Aphrodite helped Paris win, but, uh, yeah, that's bullshit. But basically, they all have the same outcome, though. 
Paris draws attention to himself, and Cassandra notices him. Now, Paris, you know, is a fine-looking guy. He's very good-looking. He's strong. He's smart. So, you know, he looks like a prince. Sounds like a prince. But Cassandra is the daughter of Priam and uh, Hecuba. And uh, she's kind of a sly woman. Basically, she made a deal with the god Apollo that if she slept with him, he would teach her the art of being able to tell the future. So she would become an oracle. But being the sly little uh, minx she was, she actually uh, had him teach her how to tell the future first and then reneged on uh, getting jiggy with Apollo. So he's like, oh, okay, bitch, that's how it's going to be. Uh, you can keep your ability to uh, tell the future, but I'm going to curse you so that whatever future you see, whenever you try to tell people what's going to happen, they won't believe you. And uh, you'll see that time and time again. And it kind of, you know, spawned the funny little comment that nobody ever believes Cassandra, <laughs> you know. So that's, uh, that's definitely going to have an impact on future events. But she does teach her twin brother, Helenus, how to tell the future. And seeing how he's not cursed, everyone believes him. So we'll definitely see more of that later on, too. So try to remember Helenus, because uh, he actually plays a pretty big role later on. So basically, Cassandra notices Paris at whatever event he's winning. And it eventually dawns on her that that is her long-lost brother, Paris. So she tells her parents, they invite the boy up to get his prize for winning. In one of the rare moments, everybody actually agrees with uh, Cassandra. Either that or, like I said, I mean, Paris seems to be the right age. He looks like a prince. He sounds like a prince. He acts like a prince. So maybe everybody was just like, you know, yeah, it makes sense, Cassandra, whatever. But, um, yeah, so Priam is... Overjoyed to have his long last son. He totally forgets the, about the uh, prophecy that Paris will be the downfall of Troy and all that. But Cassandra, being a you know oracle, just like trying to say, Hey, remember you got rid of this guy for a reason? You know, duh, hello. He's the torch that will burn all of Troy, you know? Remember that dream? But uh, again, nobody believes Cassandra. So, yeah. Um, Agalaus shows up and apologizes to Priam, saying I couldn't kill him. He was, you know, a baby, da-da-da-da-da. Priam isn't angry. He's actually, you know, you made the right call. So, uh, Paris, uh, loses his name, Alexander, and becomes Paris, Prince of Troy. So, uh, I guess a couple of days go by, and, uh, then, uh, Paris remembers, oh, yeah, I have a wife and son living on, uh, Mount Ida. I should probably go and take care of that. So he basically goes back to his wife, Ione. And, I mean, this had to be kind of a weird conversation. It probably went something like, Well, honey, I have some good news and I have some bad news. The good news is, it turns out that I'm a prince. And the bad news is, seeing how I am a prince, I can't be seen with you. So, I'm going to take off now. Oh, and uh, by the way, supposedly I'm supposed to get the most beautiful woman in the world. So, yeah. We can't still be married anyway. So, yeah. Take it easy. <laughs> so, he basically just abandons Ione and his son Corthus on uh, Mount Ida. So, yeah. That, uh, that wasn't the nicest thing. But uh, Ione, who is a, a mountain nymph. She's also a skilled uh, healer, and she says to him, and I think she's also a oracle too, so maybe she kind of knew what was coming, but she says, if he's ever injured, come see me, I'll heal you back up and stuff, so maybe she still kind of loved him, but I'm sure she was uh, very pissed off about being abandoned and stuff, and uh, we'll see... Uh, Ione and uh, Corthus later on too. Again, they go on to play kind of an interesting role in this whole tragedy that's uh, starting to... The pieces are kind of starting to fall into place for this. So, uh, yeah, so Paris goes back to Troy and uh, is, you know, raised as a proper uh, 
Trojan Prince. He learns to read, write, sword fight, ride horses, becomes a very skilled archer. And uh, basically a couple of years go by and doobadoo. So uh, let's uh, hop over to Greece and see what's going on over there while all that's going on. Basically, Peleus and Thetis get married. They have a son. They name him Achilles. And uh, like the prophecy said, Achilles is uh, born to be a much more powerful uh, man than his father was. You know, he's just a very strong, healthy boy. Now, the whole thing about the uh, Achilles heel and stuff seems to be kind of bullshit. Basically, that whole thing about the river Styx and stuff, um, that part of uh, Achilles' life didn't start to show up until a guy named Stadius wrote about it in uh, what he called the Achilleid. And uh, he wrote that in the first century AD, so this is like 1,200 years after the Trojan War when uh, the, the Achilles heel thing turned up. So I think that was a bunch of bullshit. But basically, um, Thetis gets word that Achilles will have a short life. He'll probably be killed in some war or whatever. So she takes her baby uh, Achilles to the River Styx, uh, dumps him in, but forgets about the... You know, the heel that she's holding on to him. She forgets to dump that in. So that becomes his one weak spot. His Achilles heel. Dun dun dun. So uh, another story is that she dips him in uh, ambrosia. Which is the uh, liquid that keeps the gods immortal. And uh, then she holds the baby Achilles over a fire. And just kind of burns off all the uh, parts of him that are immortal. It's kind of brutal. In fact, in that part of the story, uh, Achilles' father, Peleus, hears the baby screaming, comes in and stops Thetis, and uh, in a rage, Thetis uh, leaves Achilles and Peleus behind and just runs off in a fit of anger. You know, like she doesn't want to see her son die, but whatever. This pussy doesn't want him to suffer a little pain now and live forever later, but... Yeah, it seems like that's probably dubious Stadius' stuff, so... Well, and another thing, too, in the, the Iliad, Achilles gets injured here and there. Like, uh, I think it was the part where a guy throws a spear at him, and the, the spearhead kind of grazes his arm and stuff, so it draws a little blood. So, I mean, the whole Achilles was invulnerable thing is pretty bullshit, I think, so... Let's just add, like, that whole Achilles heel thing never happened, shall we? So Achilles grows up to be a fine boy. It's kind of weird how much younger Achilles is from everyone else. I mean, you kind of always pictured uh, Paris as kind of like the idyllic uh, 18 or 20 year old. But I mean, he's like freaking 16 or 18 years older than Achilles, give or take. So I mean, geez. I mean, when Achilles comes to uh, fight in the Trojan War, he's kind of the baby of the group. But as you will see, he makes up for that. So, um, a couple of years go by, and uh, we uh, run across uh, Patroclus, whose father, Menetius, was a good friend of Peleus, and uh, together they were actually Argonauts with uh, Jason and Heracles, or Hercules. So, uh, they were good buddies, but um, we're not really sure who Patroclus' uh, mother is. It's like a list of like four women, so... Eh. But um, it seems like it's really just Patroclus and uh, Menetius who uh, are together. So maybe something happened to his mother. I don't know. But um, yeah, Patroclus is a couple of years older than Achilles by this time. And uh, basically the way Achilles and Patroclus meet is um, one day Patroclus and his friend, let's see, Clisonomus. Oh, shit, Clisonomus. Let's go with Clisonomus, I guess. He and uh, Patroclus are playing a game of dice, and uh, I think somebody accuses the other one of cheating. They get in a, like a fight. Patroclus pushes Clisinimus. Clisinimus falls, hits the back of his head on a rock, dies. So Patroclus is just accidentally killed like his best friend. So in order to avoid revenge from Clisimonius's, uh 
parents, Menetius grabs Patroclus and gets the hell out of there. And uh, seeing how Menetius and Peleus were good friends, Menetius and Patroclus seek shelter at uh, Peleus' palace in, uh, I guess, modern-day Thessaly. And uh, that's when the two boys meet. Now, Patroclus, I guess, let's say he's probably around 8 or 10 years old at this time. Achilles is probably 5 or 6, so there's a little bit of an age difference. But uh, they seem to hit it off right off the bat, and uh, slowly but surely they become the best of friends. Alright, now it's time to switch gears and talk about Helen. Now, Helen's parents were Zeus and Leda. In case you don't remember, that was the one where Zeus turned into a swan and got jiggy with Leda, who uh, I believe was taking a bath in a lake or a pond or whatever. Yeah, that had to be kind of an odd sex scene. But um, bada bing bada boom, nine months later, Leda gives birth to two eggs. One egg has Helen in it, the other egg has her twin brothers in it. Kind of weird, but I guess it kind of makes sense. Now, a couple of years later, when uh, Helen is like, I don't know, 10 or 12, let's say, or early teens, she's actually uh, kidnapped by Theseus, you know, the guy who uh, killed the Minotaur, and uh, was also king of Athens. Basically, Theseus and his friend uh, Perithus, I guess let's say that, Perithus, um, he and uh, Theseus basically came up with a crazy idea that seeing how they were both demigods, you know, basically having one parent who was a immortal, they figured, hey, we should probably have some uh, divine wives too. Theseus wanted Helen, while Pirithus wanted Hades' wife, Persephone. I don't know what the hell these guys were thinking, <laughs> especially Pirithus. I'm like, dude, you know all the trouble Hades had to go through to get Persephone? Jesus Christ. So, uh, yeah, basically, first uh, they get together and go after Helen. Now, it's not really known whether Theseus raped Helen or not. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> doesn't really seem to be any evidence, but who knows. And then, uh, once they had her, they uh, basically, I guess, tied her up and left her in Athens or whatever. So, the two of them then uh, went off into Hades to go and get Persephone. Now, while that was going on, Helen's twin brothers, Castor and Pollux, attacked Athens and rescued her. And while they were at it, for revenge, they enslaved uh, Theseus's mother and put Theseus's main rival, Menesthus. Oh, God. Some of these Greek names. Menethus? Shit. Menethus? Theus? Yeah, let's go with Menethus. Menetheus, hey, I figured it out, Menetheus, who was also Achilles' older brother. I guess Peleus had another wife before Thetis. Um, and uh, they basically put him on the throne of Athens. And uh, kind of a side note about uh, what happened to uh, Theseus and Perithus while they were in Hades. Hades, of course, knew why they were there, to get his wife, so he basically imprisoned them both in uh, Hades. Um, but, uh, sometime later, Hercules, on his, uh, last labor, which was to, um, I think it was to capture Cerberus, who was running loose or whatever, while he was down in Hades, he actually freed Theseus, and, uh, Theseus went back up to the normal world, but, uh, he couldn't free Pirithus, because Pirithus' uh, crime was so extreme, I mean, he was gonna steal the wife of a god, that Hercules wasn't able to rescue him. So, if you ever go down to Hades, you should probably be able to still run into Pirithus. In fact, I think uh, Pirithus shows up in uh, God of War 3. Unlucky for him, he runs into Kratos. <laughs> yeah, so eh, not too good what happens to Pirithus. But I guess he kind of deserves it, trying to steal another man's wife. Fucker. Um, and I guess let's go on another tangent. Helen's uh, twin brothers, Castor and Pollux, were also Argonauts, so they were kind of badasses. Oh, and, uh, you know, that whole astrology thing and the constellations in the sky and stuff? Castor and Pollux are the Gemini twins, so they're pretty famous. That probably makes them the most famous twins of all time, so, yeah, kind of interesting. 
So, uh, unfortunately for Theseus's mother, she becomes the personal slave of Helen, so <laughs> take that, Theseus. So, uh, now a few years after that, it was finally time for Helen to get really married. So she's probably about, I don't know, 16 or 18 now. Now, for all intents and purposes, um, Helen's father is the Spartan king Tyndarius. I guess uh, Leda never told uh, Tyndarius about Zeus and the swan thing, but when he ever... So, um, and uh, one little weird thing that I guess could explain why Tyndarius never held a grudge against Helen or uh, Leda was because in one source I came across, he also had sex with uh, Leda the same night that Zeus did, so... Who knows? I guess the egg kind of makes it certain that uh, Helen is Zeus's daughter, but who knows? Maybe uh, the juice is mixed a little bit there. So, yeah, now it's time for uh, Helen to get married off. And um, basically all the great kings and princes and warlords in Greece come to uh, try to win Helen's favor and her hand. Helen uh, basically wants to marry Menelaus. I, I don't know why. I guess she disliked him. But uh, Menelaus and uh, his brother Agamemnon are kind of exiles right now, so they don't really have a kingdom, so they would really like to marry into uh, this family. Um, now, according to some sources, Menelaus didn't come himself, but sent his brother Agamemnon to uh, support his brother's case. Um, now, Tyndarius was kind of in a shitty situation, because if he picked Menelaus, then... He might be pissing off all the other kings and princes of Greece. So he might be kind of doing the same thing that Paris did. You know, he might be making a friend with one, but pissing off all the other ones. And uh, basically all the kings and princes and warlords tried to give Tyndarius gifts and, uh, you know, stuff like that. But he was smart. He didn't take any of the gifts. He didn't really show any favor towards any of them because he was so terrified of making an enemy. Then comes a uh, wily uh, Odysseus who never wanted to marry Helen. He wants to marry um, Penelope who is the daughter of uh, Tyndarius's brother Icarius. So Odysseus comes up with a solution that if uh, Tyndarius helps Odysseus convince Icarius to you know, let Penelope marry Odysseus, then Odysseus will help Tyndarius with his problem right now with Helen. So Tyndarius agrees readily that, yeah, if you can get me out of this situation, man, I'll definitely help you with my brother. So Odysseus comes up with the plan that all of the suitors of Helen should swear a most solemn oath to defend the chosen husband against whoever should quarrel with the chosen one. Basically, uh, you know, let's make an oath that if anybody screws around with uh, Helen and her husband, we will all unite against him. So, pretty clever, and Tyndarius loves the idea, and uh, there were a lot of people there. I mean, everybody was there. Even uh, Patroclus, even though he was just a kid, he tried his hand at uh, getting Helen. Uh, by most accounts, though, Achilles was too young to go, so, yeah. So, it was really just Odysseus, Ajax, Agamemnon... Just all those guys were there. So uh, they all agreed to the oath. And then probably a day or two later, that's when Tyndarius announces that Menelaus will be the husband. And uh, this is kind of really the uh, big precursor to the Trojan War, this oath. This is a really big deal. But Helen and Menelaus get married, and uh, eventually uh, Tyndarius retires and... Uh, Menelaus becomes king of Sparta, and to show good faith towards uh, the two brothers, Tyndarius also marries off his other daughter, Clytemnestra, I guess is how you say her name, to uh, Agamemnon, and that's kind of how Agamemnon gets uh, his own kingdom in Mycenae and stuff, so uh, pretty big deal, but uh, both brothers marry into royalty now, and they're on their way to becoming the most powerful kings in all of Greece. So it kind of seems like Menelaus and uh, Helen were kind of happy there for a while. Now that, uh, you know, they are king and queen of Sparta. And uh, a couple of years later, Peleus uh, sends uh, Patroclus and Achilles, who are now kind of in their teenager years, to uh, 
Mount Pelion, where they will be trained by Chiron, the centaur. And uh, Chiron teaches them uh, music, dance, singing, writing, basically warfare. Teaches them how to fight and stuff. And uh, the weird thing about Mount Pelion is it's named after Peleus. So maybe the mountain was called something else back then, but uh, whatever. And uh, Chiron's a badass. I mean, he's the one that trained... uh, Hercules, Jason, Theseus, Perseus, Peleus, and Telamon. I mean, he's, you know, the Mr. Miyagi of the ancient world. And uh, it kind of helps that his father was Kronos, so he's also a half-brother of Zeus. So, yeah, he's kind of an immortal, too. Um, But, yeah, he trains the boys, and uh, they become powerful. In fact, I think Achilles is, uh, by all accounts, considered to be... uh, Chiron's greatest pupil. So yeah, it's kind of peaceful and quiet in Greece, and uh, everybody's kind of chilling. Uh, Odysseus goes on to marry Penelope with uh, Tyndareus's uh, help, and uh, you know things are just kind of settling out and stuff. But unfortunately for the Greeks and for the Trojans, eventually, little do they know that war is literally on the horizon.